Hi, I'm Paul Thomas from the Department of Immunology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And I'm gonna talk today uh, with you about uh, the novel coronavirus and uh, the new vaccines that have come out for it. So I thought it would be helpful to, to put uh, the novel coronavirus in perspective with a virus that we're much more familiar with, which is the flu virus. You can see these are two little schematics of each of these viruses and, and they look pretty similar to each other. They're these sort of spherical bodies with um, sharp spikes coming out of them. Um, and uh, so both flu and coronavirus have a lot of features in common. They're both RNA viruses um, and they both infect our respiratory tract. And they both have these surface receptors, these little spikes here that they use to get inside of our cells. On flu, we call them uh, the hemagglutinin proteins and on coronavirus, we call them uh, the spike proteins. A big difference between flu and coronavirus is that coronavirus is much bigger than flu. So the whole virus in coronavirus has 29 proteins, whereas for flu, it's only about 10 to 14 proteins. And so that's um, made dealing with the coronavirus in some cases a bit more difficult because it's, it's got a bit more sophistication to it. So that spike protein that the coronavirus used to, uses to get inside the cell is the major target of the immune response that we're trying to generate with vaccines. And there are two kinds of immune responses that we like to generate with vaccines. The, by far the most common and the most effective are antibody responses. And antibodies are these uh, proteins that your, your body makes and secretes. And they're like little um, nets that can capture a, a virus before it gets inside a cell. And so you can see they're in blue here and they're sticking to the outside of uh, the coronavirus and specifically they're sticking to this little spike protein and they're blocking its ability to get inside the cell. They're sort of ensnaring it away from uh, the, the place that the virus wants to get, which is, is the cell in your body. There's a second kind of um, immunity that can be generated by vaccines uh, and that's called uh, the T cell response. And T cells are cells that your body makes that patrols the body and, and looks for infected cells. And once a T cell learns what a virus looks like, it can roam around the body and kill any cell that's infected with that virus. And so um, this, this kind of immunity doesn't prevent infection per se because the virus has to get inside a cell for a T cell to be able to see it. Uh, but once a cell is infected, a T cell can kill it very quickly and prevent the infection from getting much worse. And so with a vaccine, we, we hope that we produce a lot of these antibodies, which means uh, you'll never get infected. But we also hope that you produce T cells so that if you get infected, you're not infected for very long and you can't spread the infection to other people. Um, there are several different kinds of vaccines that are, are being made right now for coronavirus. Uh, the vaccines that we're, we're sort of most familiar with that we get uh, very commonly, such as the flu vaccine, are um, on the left side of this panel. And so these are things like inactivated vaccines or recombinant protein vaccines. And that just means that they're vaccines that are made up of small proteins from the virus. For instance, the spike protein, again, that we're going to show to your immune system so that it'll make antibodies and T cells, uh, learn what they look like and prevent you from being infected and from spreading that infection. And the Novavax vaccine, which is not yet approved, uh, but is in trials in the US and in Europe, um, is one of these recombinant protein vaccines. The vaccines that um, are approved that uh, we are using now in the US are the um, viral vector vaccines and the RNA vaccines. And so RNA vaccines are taking a, a very small piece of RNA and encoding uh, um, a protein from the virus in the RNA. So RNA are instructions on how to make proteins. And so it's providing your body instructions on how to make the spike protein from the virus and doing it in a way that your immune system will now recognize it and make antibodies and T cell responses to it so you won't get infected uh, when you see uh, the spike protein again. Um, and then there are, there's another kind of uh, vaccine called the viral vector vaccine. And this is the Johnson and Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccine where we take a totally unrelated virus, in this case, an adenovirus, which is another sort of common cold virus. And um, we, kill that virus. So it can't really infect um, anymore. All it can do is get inside one cell and deliver uh, a message. And the message that it delivers is again, a piece of RNA from, um, uh, from, <coughs> um, from the coronavirus, in this case, again, the spike protein. And it will um, instruct those cells to make the spike protein for a short time to teach your immune system how to see it again. And so um, these two types of vaccines haven't been used um, 
in, uh, in, uh, until relatively recently, but they have been used in, in a number of other uh, uh, different trial studies for uh, preventing infections. So we have a bit of experience now, particularly with these RNA vaccines for how good they are and how long the protection lasts. And so this is looking at one paper um, from, uh, from one of these studies on uh, one of the Moderna vaccines. And uh, looking in different age groups across you know, several months, uh, the antibody response that's being measured here after the RNA vaccine vaccination seems to persist for quite a while. So at least out until the three or four months that was measured in this study, there was not a large amount of waning of the antibody response. Um, and so we would expect that these vaccines would at least last us a year or two years before a booster response would be needed like we do with other vaccines like tetanus and uh, the influenza vaccine. This just summarizes, uh, again, some of the data from the phase one trials, which are the very early safety and efficacy trials that are done um, for a number of these different platforms. Again, you've, you've probably heard about the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, which are the RNA vaccines. Um, and then the Novavax vaccine, which is one of those recombinant protein vaccines, which is just protein. And the key thing to look at in this, in this um, chart here is that for all these different vaccines that are described here, this column right here corresponds to the neutralization titer after boost. And what that is, is just a measure of the amount of antibodies that are produced after the vaccination. And you can see these, these very high numbers here and higher numbers mean better. Um, and so uh, all of these vaccines are generating uh, very high numbers of antibodies uh, after exposure in humans. And then the phase three trials are the last trials that are done usually in tens of thousands of people. Uh, these have been completed in the US for Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson or the Janssen vaccine. And uh, all three of these vaccines are now approved. So two of them are RNA vaccines. One of them is the inactivated virus vaccine. And then Novavax uh, is, is quite far along as well in the US and um, likely to be approved, I would expect, or to apply for approval soon. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to talk about is how these vaccines uh, appear to work. So um, we do know that the RNA vaccines, at least so far, look like they're working very well in older people, which has been a population that's sometimes hard to vaccinate. Uh, some other vaccines don't work very well in older people. And so this is comparing uh, two different kinds of the Pfizer vaccine. The one that people are getting now is this uh, 162B2, so the ones in blue here. And it's looking at three different doses of the Pfizer vaccine in two different age groups, so in younger folks and in older folks. And you can see in younger folks, basically any dose of vaccine that was given generated you know, really high bars here, which correspond to the antibodies uh, that were generated by the vaccine. And older folks, uh, to get the really high bars, you needed that higher dose of the vaccine. And that's the dose that people are given now. So um, everybody's going to be making a good response uh, to the Pfizer vaccine based on, on the data here. Um, and then the, uh, the other chart over here is a question about whether or not you need the vaccine after you've been infected. And what these data show is um, in the people in yellow here are people that had already been infected prior to getting the vaccine. And it's measuring, again, the level of antibodies that they had. Each dot here is a different person that was infected with um, the virus and the amount of antibodies they had. And after the first dose of vaccine, you can see their antibodies go way up. Um, and um, compared to someone that has uh, never had the vaccine before or been infected, they make higher amounts, but they basically make about the same amount of antibody as somebody that got two doses of the vaccine um, that had never had the infection before. So out here at the, at the higher end of, of the um, dose response. And so what it shows is that actually, even if you've had the infection before, you can still make more antibodies and that probably helps protect you more from uh, being reinfected later um, and potentially from being infected with some of these variant viruses that are, are coming around. And so uh, still a recommendation that even if you've been infected that you would um, get the vaccine again. And that's all I wanted to tell you about today. Uh, thank you for your time.